this goes. Okay. Yeah, right. Yes, I guess we're live. Dabai. Dabai. Live on YouTube. Russell Bentley, it's a great pleasure to have you on again. And uh, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, it's been like a little bit, a little bit more than a year since we last spoke. And uh, first time I uh, took some time to ask you about your uh, background and how you ended up from being a US citizen and now being a DPR, a DPR citizen. A Russian citizen. And a Russian too. citizen now, yeah. Yep. DPR last time we talked. Uh, and uh, But I know things haven't been easy in, in uh, specifically and particularly where you live. You live in Petrovsky, Petrovsky district in Donetsk city. Well, we we have a house in Petrovsky, but uh, I mean, it's so hot there that uh, like for the last year, we have been living in an apartment in the center of the city. Our house in Petrovsky, it's uh, just a few kilometers from the front line in Marienka. Uh We have uh, Ukraps up near uh, Stary Mikhailovka and uh, down south of uh, Alexandrovka too. So basically... Petrovsky kind of sticks out. It's surrounded by Ukraps on three sides. Um, our house has not been directly hit, but uh, we have had heavy artillery. I'm talking like HIMARS and 155s land within 100 meters. Wow. Our house has been damaged. The roof, windows, uh, siding has been damaged three times already. So, you know, if... Um, you know, if since we had a chance, we have a friend of ours that moved uh, out of Donetsk because of shelling, had an apartment in the center, and she said uh, that um, she would she would let us live there, and so we've been uh, living in the apartment in the center for about a year. It's been hot, plenty hot in the center too, but you know, not like Petrovsky. Okay, so, yes, because I was really wondering how is to. Because, yeah, I've seen on the map Petrovsky, like you said, it's surrounded. It's close to the front line. When you say hot, let me just explain to the audience. Hot means uh, that sh a shell can land on you. Uh, and uh, it's uh, okay. I'm glad then you, you've, you've taken some safe precautions. But I and I can see you still uh, hold hold your gear close to you just in case. Yep, <laughs> uh, you know, it's... Uh... It's, it's very, I mean, there's a lot of veterans here. What happened was a few years back, uh, you know, pretty much everybody in Donetsk, you know, had a weapon. And, you know, they weren't registered. It was, you know, it was illegal, but nobody was really bothering anybody about it because it was understood that, hey, the Ukraps can come anytime. Um you know, these most of these guys were veterans that, you know, they got them, you know, as trophies from the front in battle. So, you know, who, nobody wants to try and take those away. So what they did a few years back, they said, all right, everybody that has an unregistered weapon, you know, it's illegal. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to let you come and register your weapon. And then and we're not going to ask any questions about where you got it or anything like that. We're going to allow you to keep it. And uh, I mean, there was certain procedures and they're intelligent procedures. Like you had to take your weapons to uh, the prosecutor's laboratory. They fired uh, five shells from each weapon into a bucket of water. So they had the ballistics, not only of the projectile, but also of the casing. Mm -hmm. So that if your weapon was used in a crime and they recovered the projectile or the casing, they would know whose weapon it was, which makes perfect sense. Yes, you know? it does. Uh, you also, you had to go to a, uh, you had to meet a psychiatrist and talk for two or three hours to make sure that you weren't, uh, you know, something like an Azov, Pravi Sector, yes. lunatic or something. Yes. Um, 
And uh, also you have to have at your house uh, like a, a solid metal, solid steel safe that is bolted to the floor and bolted to the wall. So that, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be impossible to break into because nothing's impossible <laughs> yeah, to break course. into. But, you know, just so that if some punk breaks a window and comes in to, you know, rob your liquor cabinet or something, you know, they can't like look under the bed and grab your gun. They have yeah. to, you know, do some work to get to it. So these are all reasonable things. And mm -hmm. so during that time, it was like an amnesty of like two months. I went, I have an AK, I have a Makarov pistol. I registered them. So I'm allowed to carry the pistol with me, which I do. Believe me, bro, I do every time I step outside. I mean, if I go take the garbage out, you know. You, how is I about have my pistol. Okay, but you know, is, I don't, is I that don't a... wear it like outside of my pants? You know, I'm not like, oh, look at me, I've yeah, got a gun. Open I carry. It, you know, I have like one of these man purse uh, bags and stuff, and I keep it in there. You know, so it's low key. I don't want to go around like showing off or anything, but it's nice to, you know, what's the old saying? Uh, it's better to have it and not need it than need, need it and it not, not have having it. it yeah. But uh, but is it just uh, what is it your what is your main concern now for for uh, the main reason for using for carrying a weapon now inside of Donetsk? Is it uh, well, is the crime has been up or? Well, I mean, as far as the AK seventy four that's behind me here, <clears throat> that uh, I like to have in case you know somebody starts kicking in my door in the middle of the night. Um, in case the Ukrainians, because you understand, of course, that the Ukrainian army from here where I am in the center of Donetsk, the front line in Avdiivka is uh, seven miles away. The Ukrainian army is seven miles from here. You know, okay. if they bust through the front line, you know, and start pouring into the center of Donetsk, you know, they're going to be rounding people up. And my name is on that list. Yeah, on, um... might not be the first one on that list. But it's definitely on there. And I don't want to just, you know, I mean, and of course, if they bring a BMP and a squad of, you know, probably sector or something, I ain't going to have much of a chance. Yes. But it's better than, you know, throwing rocks at them or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that is your main concern, not the crime in the society of Donetsk. No, no, no. In, in, in Donetsk, the crime is negligible. Okay. Bro, I mean, it's it's. It's safer than any city in Europe or the U.S. Okay. You know, of comparable size. You know, I mean, Donetsk and Makievka, it's like two cities that are basically one metro area. Mm -hmm. And the crime here is, I mean, it's, you you can hardly even think, I mean, you know, I, I, leave, I leave my keys in my car sometimes when I go to the grocery store. All right. What you, you wouldn't want to do that in in Paris. Or no, in no, 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 or... no, 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 <laughs> Even some some parts of Portugal, you you wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, yes, I. Uh, uh, it's but it's it's good to hear. But how is the society holding on together? One year after since we spoke in Donetsk, because I know that the violence has increased. I mean, at some point, the Ukrainian army has been shelling with petrol mines, and. Uh, they and they've That's been shelling like the the places where people go to sh shop groceries uh and uh, how is it and they i know that they've i have testimonies i've heard testimonies that they like shell wait an hour for help to come and then shell again do you confirm this i confirm that exactly there was a in fact they even themselves the ukraps published a video uh where they bombed an area in Petrovsky, a civilian area. And then when the first day the ambulance came, they hit directly the ambulance. They killed three doctors and the ambulance driver. They did it on purpose. I mean, it was filmed from a Ucrop drone. So, you know, the guy flying that drone, he called up, he said, hey, there's an ambulance there. Hit the same place again. And they did. And, and three good doctors and a heroic first aid responder ambulance driver were killed, you know, were murdered. They were civilians and they were intentionally slaughtered by, you know, genuine Nazis, you know, how, terrorists. how is the, how is the, uh, the, 
I we, we I want to talk about this more generally, but uh, I'm taking the chance that you are in Donetsk, so to talk about specifically of about. Of course, a, I am in Donetsk. Uh, I'm in the center of Donetsk yes, right now. I, yes, uh, and because it's my of, city. And because of that, I want to talk also uh, things that you see. How is it in uh, in terms of? You can hear me clear, right? Yes, yes, I can. Uh, okay. Uh, in terms of like the mobilization, the youth of Donetsk, are they? Do they have to uh, present themselves to some kind of office or? No, they... right now the mobilization is not going on. I mean, at the beginning a year ago. Mobilization was pretty serious, and they, you know, I mean, it wasn't like in Ukraine where they kick your door in and <laughs> yeah. drag you off, but you know, it was it was pretty serious. A lot of guys, you know, uh, did get stopped on the street, mm -hmm. and um, if they were lucky, they got to go home and pack a bag before they went off to boot camp. But right now, I mean, mobilization is not a big deal. Um, it's, it you know. The mobilization here is no bigger than the mobilization in Russia, which, you know, accordingly from the guys that were mobilized was like 300,000 and like 600,000 volunteered in Russia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as and, and Russia hasn't been having the uh, casualty rate that um, the Ukrainians have. So, you know, when the Ukrainians are saying, OK, it's everybody from 16 to 60. And maybe we're going to start doing you, uh, women too. In Russia, it's like, okay, we got enough guys. We're being careful. Uh, we're not just throwing them, you know, as meat to the front. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, right now, you know, we're we're good, and the mobilization is not really um, a factor at the moment. Okay, so it's uh, people. Uh, there are enough volunteers for it. You mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, you don't see a lot of. I mean, you see some, but you don't see a lot of military age guys, civilians walking around in Donetsk these days. I mean, because most of them have volunteered. Okay. And the ones that didn't have been helped to volunteer. <laughs> uh, I understand that. Uh, I remember when the conflict was not as uh, well. Let's put it this way: it was a little bit different from today. It was when you first volunteered back in 2014 15 mm -hmm. uh, i remember it was a very low profile reporting on western media and uh, i know that a lot of foreign volunteers were joining the dpr and the dnr militia and uh, how is that now are there are still the same level of uh, foreign volunteers going there to join are they easily admitted how does that it's, work now uh, there's a lot of people that have contacted me asking you know from from different countries asking how to volunteer i mean but it's a totally different deal here i mean not these days in 2014 you know the people's militia here you know they really needed everybody that could pull a trigger you know so i showed up there was a, a russian guy a couple of spanish guys a couple of italian guys uh my colombian friend uh alexis castillo um you know and, and back then it was like, OK, you know, if you know what you're doing, if you're not a, an idiot or a coward, we'll take you and mm -hmm. we'll put you on the front and see how you do. These days, um, you know, Russia has to be very careful about, first of all, you know, like, uh, you know, plants, you know, double agents or something. Okay. Somebody that would say, oh, I want to come in. You know, I'm from the U.S. and I used to be in special forces or something, but now I'm against it and. You know, and, and then it turns out to be a spy or, you know, an assassin or something like that, yeah. you know. So it's much more selective. I mean, the main point is, is that we have the guys we need right now, you know. So, okay. you know, when you have plenty, you can be more selective. You can pick and choose. Of course. You know, I mean, still, I mean, like Wagner. Yes. You know, if, if uh, you know, if people want to join and help you know, defend Russia and the future of humanity, they can contact Wagner because, you know, Wagner uh, will take anybody, but, you know, I mean, they won't take, any, you know, if, if it's a, like, 
you know, somebody in a wheelchair or yeah, of course. Insane, yeah, yeah. they're not going to take them, but they'll give anybody a chance and they'll see how they do. You know what I mean? And, and if, if they can't cut it, then they'll say, all right, go home. You know, if there's some kind of spire trader, they'll say, Hey, let me show you this sledgehammer, you know? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I understand the, the sledgehammer and the, but, uh, the, the Wagner talking about Wagner, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's been a hell of a, I mean, I remember, and I, I kept following your posts on, on previous occasions. Uh, mm -hmm. We had the Ukrainian offensive from last fall, uh, which uh, gave the Western media a lot of joys. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some criticism from the, from the more pro-Russian uh, media as well. A lot of criticism to that. And then came Wagner and presented uh, the Russian side with uh, a lot of successes, unexpected uh, military successes. And mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, you also uh, have been praised them, but with the last events, how how does all this, do you know, is Wagner still a thing? Are they going yes, to- Yes, it's very much still a thing. Uh, you know, there's, and unfortunately what happened was that I mean, ever, I mean, since like 2014, 15, when Wagner was working in Syria, there was friction even then between Prigozhin and the Russian Ministry of Defense and the Minister of Defense. Yes. And uh, Prigozhin about a month ago came out and uh, he told a story about What happened in February of 2018, uh, 200 Wagner troops were making an assault in uh, Deir ez -Zor, Syria, on a Conoco refinery that was being held by ISIS. Um, they were guaranteed by the Ministry of Defense, or this is this is what Prigozhin said. Okay? Yes, yes, I Prigozhin's account. I have a friend who was there, but I have not, and he and he was there. He was there. He was one of the guys, one of those 200 guys. But I haven't asked him since Prigozhin told you what I'm about to say that he said. I haven't met with my friend again, who's now a very high officer in Wagner and a great, great guy, great soldier. And uh, but Prigozhin said that when they were given the mission to take this refinery, uh, the Ministry of Defense of Russia said we're going to activate our air defense because this uh, ISIS, this these were backed up by. American. Yes, yes, US. Army American aircraft. Yeah. And so the Russian MOD, according to Prigozhin, said, okay, we're going to activate our air defense. We're going to put some fighters in the air. You know, we're going to give you air cover for this mission. And so the Wagner guys started out on foot, you know, because it was like at night, they're, you know, making a surprise attack. So they couldn't just go driving up. And right as the sun went down, they started walking. It was going to be like midnight when they got to their objective. And according to Prigozhin, as soon as they left, orders came from the top of the Ministry of Defense, you know, shut down the air defense radars. Don't let the aircraft take off and don't tell the Wagner dudes that we did this. That's what he said. Okay. And, and so... The Wagner guys went into a terrible ambush. They were slaughtered by American uh, aircraft, uh, helicopters, and fighters, bombers, and uh, most of them died. And Prigozhin went on to say, and he said this, this just came out like a couple of weeks ago. He specifically said, he said, and I looked up, you know, I tried to get a meeting with Shoigu for months after that. I finally met him at like a thing in Moscow. And I asked him about it. I said, I want to talk to you about what happened on February 18th. And uh, Shoigu basically just told him, you know, get out of my face, you know. Okay. So, okay, so I don't, I'm not saying that what Prigozhin said was true. But I am saying this. If what he said wasn't true, he should have been arrested the next day after he said it because he You know, he put it out there publicly and he's like saying, okay, Shoigu and the Ministry of Defense betrayed soldiers. You know, yes. they let Russian people get murdered. 
know, they stabbed him in the back. So either if it was true, then that says one thing. If it wasn't true. Yeah. And and yet and and nobody addressed it. Not, nobody in Moscow, yeah. you know, said, hey, what is this? They just totally ignored it, even when he said it. And so that says another thing, you know. Okay. I mean, I know that a lot of people in Donbass really love Prigozhin. They, I mean, a lot of soldiers and citizens really love him. They really love Wagner. I mean, uh, and they don't feel that way about the Russian Ministry of Defense. You know, I mean, there's been a lot of things. I mean, for example, in, in 2017, I worked – I had been out of the army for about a year. I went back in. I worked on the Avdiivka front, um, you know, very frontline positions. And by then, the Russian Ministry of Defense had come in and was like uh, taking co-command from the Don Donetsk People's Republic Army, and so it was like every battalion. They had their local battalion commander, and then they had their Russian battalion commander. And the Russian battalion commander had the final say. And in 2017, the order came down. And we're in frontline positions. We're getting shot at, shelled every day on mm -hmm. our positions, right? And the order came down. Okay, when you go to the frontline position from the barracks, we're going to count the bullets in your magazines Ooh. you know uh, ak holds yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay so if you get shot at you need to call back to the battalion commander who will then call the russian battalion commander and get permission to shoot, before back. You can shoot back because oh you know it's uh the minsk agreement and russia is going to you know abide by it and we're not going to break any of the rules even if the U-crops do. And okay. so that wasn't a very popular decision, you know, because, you know, it basically means we're going to abide by the Minsk agreement, even if it means our guys get killed. Do you think many of many of the mistakes made in the, in this war, and, I, and now I ask on both sides, do you think it has the political hand has had a big intervention there? Of course, of course. You know, I mean, it's and it's it's clear now. I mean, it's clear now that I mean, and of course the Minsk Agreement. You know, uh, Merkel and Macron yeah, and yeah. Uh, Hollande have all said now it was just a big trick. You know, yeah. we chose the Russians. Yeah. Uh, you know, we played them along for yeah. seven years. You know, and the thing is, it's it's not really credible that the Russian political and military leaders, you can't, you know, you can't say, oh, they were so stupid. They, you know, how can they be so stupid? They weren't stupid. Nobody can be that stupid. No one can be that stupid. Okay. You know, it was deal, a deal was made. Yes. You know, and deals are still made. You know I mean? Uh, because I, I can tell you this, everybody here in Donetsk, we knew that uh, the Minsk agreement was bogus from the get-go. We knew it. Yeah, you were being shelled. <laughs> you were being yeah, shelled, yeah. You know, how, how, how can the, the big shot, you know, intelligence services and military and foreign ministry and all that, how can they not know it too, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, and here's something that really disturbed me was recently when uh, uh, some African leaders came to Moscow and Putin met with them, and he showed an agreement. He explained why uh, the Russian army had withdrawn from you know, Kiev. They were close to Kiev last year. Yeah. They said, you know, Kiev was getting ready to make an agreement with us and uh, they signed it. And so we withdrew in our gesture of goodwill. And then Boris Johnson came and said, no, 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 we don't allow you. Yeah. You know, which, of course, it proves, first of all, that, you know, Zelensky is a puppet. Yeah. Ukraine is controlled by a foreign you know, gal lighters. Um, but it also proves that, again, you know, whoever it was, 
and he didn't and Putin didn't show who it was that signed on the Russian side. But whoever it was, you know, again, you have to ask, can they really be that stupid? Okay. You know, I mean, that's they can't even find their own ass with both hands, you know. Okay. And, you know, so. And and part of that agreement was was that the. Uh, the future of Donbass would be decided between the two heads of state. You know, which is not something that engenders a lot of confidence for people here, you know? No. I mean, because it starts smelling a lot like Kherson or Bucha, you know, or Kharkov, you know, I mean, it's like, you know what happens when the Ukraps come in. And I mean, they've, they've already said it a hundred times. We're going to kill everybody. Yeah. Yeah. They did. They did. And so, you know, and at this point when, and you know, uh, Prigozhin was not the only guy that was complaining about not having enough ammunition, not by a long shot, you know, and there's even to this day, there's, you know, the Russian soldiers, you know, they have everything they need. Okay. And they sit on the third line. Who sits on the front line here is DPR and you know, local soldiers, you know, they're, they're, you know, after Wagner, the DPR soldiers are the best in the uh, Russian army because they have almost 10 years of combat experience. experience you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, and we get these dudes, you know, Russian lieutenants, you know, straight out of, you know, the military academy show up on the front line position, want to take, uh, command of a platoon or of a company and and they have zero combat experience and you know and they and they think that you know uh it's more important to shine your boots than to clean your weapon you know if you yeah i do i do understand there. that kind of mentality uh, it's uh it, it's a it's a kind of a characteristic that you can find in almost every armies which is the yeah. the battle experience versus the 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 school mm -hmm. I don't know how to say it way of uh, thinking that you want to be stricter than the rules you want to <laughs> yeah and yeah, uh, you know, I mean it's it's and look I mean I love Russia I respect Vladimir Putin I'm very glad that the special military operation started exactly when it did because the Ukraps were getting ready to bust into Donetsk a week after when the special military operation started. It was all planned. I mean, it's... You put out some all... videos. I remember you put out yes. some videos those days, yes. And I was yeah, like, yeah, and... yeah, just before the the the, the Russians uh, mm -hmm. got in, you were like putting out videos, listening to the, to the shelling coming from the other side. And it was increasing. It was like artillery preparation for the attack. That's right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, and so, you know, I love Russia. I'm proud to be a Russian citizen. I respect Putin. And I'm glad that they came in when they did. But, you know, you see some Russian dudes strutting around on S these days like, hey, you know, you're lucky we came in and saved your ass. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and, and he's, and those guys got it backwards because who defends Donbass defends Russia. Yeah. Yeah. So the DPR and LPR army defended Russia for eight years before the Russians yeah. finally got yeah, here. Yeah. True. They've you been know? at the forefront of, of this. Yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, and we're all one family now. And I mean, and every family has its squabbles and its disagreements, but I mean, you know, you have to give the the soldiers, the true heroes of the DPR and the LPR their due, man. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, they've, they have, have done the hardest fighting and they've sustained the most casualties, even in the special military operation. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I, I would, I sometimes I think about that, about the Russian casualties that are not, uh, well, I don't hear, I, I follow the, 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 the updates mostly through uh, Telegram uh, uh, mm -hmm. 
and mostly pro-Russian. I tried to follow also pro-Ukrainian to see the other version of the story. Mm -hmm. But the most uh, the most substantial uh, information comes from the pro-Russian channels and the mm -hmm. Russian MOD. And, and I want to oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. No, and I was just wondering that because the Russian casualties are very unknown. Of course, if you turn on the CNN. Uh, you will say that the Russians have been decimated, but that's you know that's untrue as well. So I was trying to find yeah. the truth. And, and what's, what's, what's your take true. on that? I mean, yeah. the uh, Ukrainians have sustained far, far more casualties than the Russian army has. I mean, although you know it's it's not like um, they've only had a dozen guys that day; they've had thousands die. Yeah, and. And and most of those guys were, first of all, Wagner troops, and second of all, LPR and DPR troops. Right. And that's that's a simple fact, and I'll tell you that. And 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 the thing is, even to this day, you know, there are still very serious shortages of very important equipment that the Russians have. You know, sitting in Rostov or sitting in, you know, the third line of defense and our guys on the front lines, on the Donbass front, on the city limits of Donetsk don't have, man. And I'm talking about, you know, I mean, and of course, drones and vehicles, you know, and some high, you know, thermal imagers, fairly high dollar items. But I mean, I did a human aid thing. Uh, I saw that. Uh, a couple of weeks ago yeah. or so. Yeah. And I mean, and we brought a couple of drones and, you know, but we also were bringing like gloves and flashlights. Yeah. I was like, uniforms. yeah, I was like, I was like wondering what's, what's with that. I mean, that should be the basic gear of the, of the, of the guys exactly, at the front. Exactly. Exactly. And there's still a lot of units that are not getting what they need from Russia. And I mean, and the, and the Russian units that have, you know, like the Chechens, you know, I mean, when they first showed up, you know, it was like, uh, you know, they called them the pretty boys, you know, the uh, the TikTok guys. Yeah, the, you know, the, they had, the TikTok battalion. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, and I got nothing bad to say against the Chechens. They've done some serious good fighting here and they are respected by the people here in Donbass and we're glad to see them. But, you know, the guys on the very front line are the guys that need the stuff the most and ought to get it first. Of course. And yeah. when it's, you know, dudes sitting there, you know, they're like, you know, looking at the, you know, looking at the stars or something with a, with a thermal imager. When, I mean, and believe me, back in 2015, um, a thermal imager saved the life of me and three other guys because I caught a sniper that was just about sneaking up. I mean, he was... 75 meters away from us and if i hadn't and it was pitch dark if i hadn't had a thermal imager you know when the sun came up in the morning and the next shift uh, of guard duty came to re relieve us it would have been brrr, we'd have, we'd have all been dead before we even knew what it is all right unless he didn't kill one or two of us so he could take them takes back and tortures to death, you know. Uh, are, are military people at the front allowed to question this and to complain about this? Um, yes, and they do, and they do. And, and I'll tell you who complains about it the most is the good, great Russian people that are bringing that stuff to them, you know. I mean, but the point is that it's, you know, so Russian civilians. You know, I mean, there's Russian grannies that are, you know, uh, knitting these camouflage nets, you know, okay. and, uh, you know, that are contributing to buy, I mean, even, you know, you know what is reactive armor on, yeah, a, on yes. a tank? Yes, yes, I know. Okay, it's, I a, know. it's an explosive that when a, 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 a RPG round shape charge hits it, That's, he... if, if shape charges hit metal, there's a, a, a jet stream of super hot metal that'll cut right through the tank armor like butter, you know? Yep. But if, if, if it hits an explosive, that reactive re explosive goes back and it breaks up yep. the jet stream. So, I mean, it, it, it's the difference between life and death, and death for the yeah. guys in the tank. Yeah. And there's a, there's a guy, a great guy, Alexi Rodriguez, who's been doing 
uh, human aid for soldiers, you know, since the beginning of the special military operation, at least probably before. But, you know, his main thing is getting reactive armor. And, you know, he says, you know, he knows a unit of DPR tanks. And there's 50 tanks. What model? Just for uh, We well, didn't say it doesn't matter. Yeah. But, you know, but he says most of them don't have reactive armor. So they're, okay. you know, they're sitting ducks. If they get hit with a, with an anti-tank, yeah, yeah. then they're done. Yeah. And if they have it, you know, there's a good chance that they'll live. They'll survive. Yeah. So, so that's the kind of stuff. I mean, it's life and death type stuff that there are still shortages of for the guys on the front, you know, so it doesn't matter, you know, how many T nineties, you know, are in, uh, you know, Nizhny Novgorod or, yeah. Yeah. you know, something like that, Volgograd with all the latest armor and stuff. It matters to the guys who are on the front, you know. So, again, there are some serious problems, you know, as there are in every war. We, uh, we hope and we expect and we pretty much demand that these problems get taken care of because those problems – are paid for in the lives and blood of our heroes, our brothers. Do you what do you think that is the Russian MOD core strategy for this war? But is the attrition war a correct analysis, a correct assessment? Uh, I, I cannot tell you, man. But I'll, I'll tell you this, and it's uh, the people here. They say it like this: that until the bridges, okay? There's like 40 bridges across the Dnieper River in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And like a dozen of them are railroad bridges. And that's the main way of moving troops and heavy equipment to the Donbass front in eastern, you know, hey, what used to be Ukraine. Yes. So those railroad bridges move at least $700 million dollars worth of Russian products through Ukraine to Europe every month. And that's not counting gas or oil. When you mean Russian products, you mean like uh, for uh, civilian retail and things like this? Yes, exactly. Oh. 700 million a month of dollars it's not much i mean it's not chump change you know it's but is, uh but is it is it chunk. supposed to be a, a division an isolation uh well i mean you know what and that's again you know somebody's making a good chunk of money off of that because you understand i mean and that's the thing the fact of the matter is the biggest enemy that the Russian people have, that the Russian military has, that the soldiers on the front have, is real traitors in Moscow. That's our most dangerous enemy. The oligarchs that are making money off of this war. Okay. You know, I mean, and I mean, it's like I saw recently a deal. Um, there's a company in Russia that was making drones for the front. That and they were basically buying Chinese parts, putting them together. They spend seventy thousand, seventy thousand on the parts, and then another fifty or seventy thousand putting them together, and then they were selling them to the Russian army for two and a half million rubles. Oof. Oof. You know, so there's profiteering in every war, but when when people care more about making money for themselves than they do about the future of their country or the future of humanity, which is really at stake here, which is what we're really fighting for. Existential, then, yes. then, you know, they're not just traitors. They're the enemies of humanity and they, you know, they should be made an example of, and they're not, you know, and I'm not saying why, but I mean, the decisions that have been made since I got here, you know, almost 10 years ago now, 
a lot of them don't make any sense unless you say, well, you know, somebody's making a deal with the other side, you know. Okay. So And, there is some truth to when in Western media is claimed that uh, a lot of, uh, of the Russian apparatus is inefficient due to corruption. So there is some truth to that. There's uh, quite a bit of truth to that. Uh, okay. You know, I mean, nowhere not like to the extent of Ukraine or the United States yeah, yeah, or Europe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, to an extent there is. And I mean, and I've said this for the last year. I say that the military war and the economic war are two sides of the same coin. And as goes one, so goes the other. The other. Yeah. And if you want to know how the military war is going, all you have to do is go look at the uh, exchange rate between the Russian ruble and the U.S. dollar. Uh, well, you know, the, for, the Russian ruble has been pretty low now. I've been uh, following that's that. That's right. Uh, that's right. You know, I mean, and from 2014 when I got here until, you know, 2022, You know, it was basically, it, it stayed around between 60 and 65 and 75 rubles to the dollar. Yeah. And today it's 93. Okay. What? And that's not a good sign. That's not a good sign. No, it isn't. And, it isn't. And, you know, and I'll tell you something else that really is uh, very disturbing. In the last year, or rather in 2000, you know, From the beginning of 2022 to the beginning of 2023, there was 22 new Russian billionaires. Okay. Okay. That's that's also a very typical symptom. Uh-huh. But let me tell you something. Okay. So it went uh, in at the beginning of 2022, there was 180 Russian billionaires. At the end of 22, there was 210. I'm mean, excuse me, 188 at the beginning. Yeah. And 2010 at the end. And 210, you mean? Yes. yes. I, excuse me. Yes. Yeah, 210 yes. billionaires, Russian billionaires. And the collective wealth of these 210 had increased in 2022. By a hundred and fifty billion dollars, just in one year, and that's that's not it's not that two hundred and ten billionaires have a hundred and fifty billion, it's that their wealth increased. increased. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By a hundred and fifty billion in one year. Ooh. Okay, so when you think about that, and when you think about guys on the front, you know that don't have drones or thermal imagers, you know, which are absolutely, you know, life essential equipment. They don't even have uniforms or gloves or flashlights. Yeah. And then you think that that 150 billion that the 210 Russian billionaires wealth increased by that's two years. The Russian military budget is about $75 billion dollars a year. Yeah. So these parasites Increase their wealth by enough to pay for the Russian military budget for two full years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I'm I'm a communist. I hate billionaires. I, I'm a communist too. All of them. I hate all of them. Yes, I would be glad to put every single billionaire on the planet in the guillotine myself. <laughs> you know, and I mean that. Love seriously. your sincerity, man. Love your sincerity. And I do mean it because they, you know, because they. The parasite class is the enemy of humanity. True, true. Inequality, really man. True, you know? mm -hmm. So, you know, these 210 parasites, you know, that, I mean, and half of them live in, you know, Luxembourg or, you know, the south of France or, you know, I mean, they're not even, they have a Russian passport and they make their money in Russia and then they take it somewhere else. Yes. And the fact that the economic policy of the Russian Federation is as 
the nicest way I can say is confusing okay. and dysfunctional as the military policy. But those two policies are absolutely linked, connected. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I'll say this, that, you know, you know, dudes like uh, Martyanov and Ritter, they say, oh, Russia's going to win, and, you know, they can they can take Ukraine in two weeks. Yeah, stuff. yeah, I wanted to ask you about th those opinions, yeah, as well. Well, I mean, it's, for, okay, so first of all, you know, I have to say about Scott Ritter that, uh, you know, he's, he's just he's a he's just a clown dude he's an opportunist he doesn't know what he's talking about okay he doesn't even care to know what he's talking about all he wants to do is say whatever people want to hear so he can get more views and get on some other talk show and you know i mean he dude he came here he came to russia yeah yeah i know i know that i know and that. he traveled from vladivostok you know all the way to saint petersburg across 11 time zones 11,000 miles of Russia. He went everywhere. He was in Lake Baikal fishing. He was on the bullet train, business class. You know, he was, uh, uh, his trip was financed by, you know, Russian oligarchs. Okay. He went to And, promote a book, wasn't it? Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing is, he went everywhere in Russia. Dude, he was... On, on Red Square for the 9th of May, sitting in the stands. He went everywhere except Donbass. Okay. Can, uh, he, did not, he didn't even come to Rostov, bro. The, do he people... Let me ask you this. Do, do people... Are people allowed to go to Donbass, for example, if they enter Russia as a tourist? Or do, do, are they allowed to go there, just if, travel there? or If you... I mean... It's not like a vacation spot. Yeah, I mean, of course. Of course, of course. You get checked, <laughs> yeah. But if you have like a legitimate reason to go, I mean, if you're, you know, if you're not, uh, you know, uh, a pro Western journalist, you know, if you have family or friends there, let's see, you know, if you're, let's say pathetically that I would travel there and I say, I want to go and visit and interview Russell in person. Um, yes, just like yes, this. you could come. Yes, you okay. could come. Okay. I mean, the 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 big problem now is not. I mean, if you can get a Russian visa, then and if you have if you know someone in Donetsk, in which you have a friend in Donetsk, bro, come on, I'll get you in, Mo. Because okay. you know what? It's Russia now. It's Russia now. Yeah. Okay. And so. So yes, if you have a legitimate reason, if you're going to be doing some good work here. Then yes, it's no problem. If you get into Russia, you can get into Donetsk, you know. Okay. But I mean, so and and Ritter, you know, absolutely. I mean, whatever his excuses, and that's the question that everybody ought to be asking him. Is I mean, two questions. First of all, what makes you think you know anything about it? You know, from five thousand miles away, you live in America. You know, you're getting your information off the internet. You know, you. I mean, he he was right back in what, 2003, when he said there weren't any weapons of mass destruction? He was right back then, right. yes. yes. He was right. But again, everyone that wasn't an idiot knew that <laughs> back then, including myself. You know, and I just, I respected him for being the public face that said it, but anyone that thought there were was a, was a complete imbecile. Yes. You know, I mean, so it wasn't like he was, you know, uh, Julian Assange or something, you know, I mean, he... Yeah, like, know, yeah, yeah. He, he, You know, and 2003 was a long time ago now, you know, and a lot of 20 years. stuff has happened since then. I mean, you know, the guy's an opportunist in my book. He's just trying to make a name and money for himself. And he doesn't know what he's talking about. That's the thing. You know, he's like he's telling people what they want to hear. And when he has the opportunity to find out and know what he's talking about, he doesn't take it. You know, he he didn't come to Donetsk. I've offered to interview him, debate him. He, you know, he totally chickened out. He said, you know, I have no respect for Bentley as a military man. And you know what? I can tell you that Ritter was never, ever in combat. He was an ass kisser for General Norman Schwarzkopf. He was a, what we called in the real army, which I was also in the American army. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I know, I know. We used to call dudes like him REMFs, R-E-M-F. 
And the RE stands for rear echelon, and you can figure out what the MF stands for. You know, I was a frontline trooper in the U.S. Army. I was a combat engineer. I guarded the East German and Czechoslovakian border with live rounds with with truckloads of C4 explosives. You know, looking through binoculars at East German soldiers looking back at me. You know, um, Ritter was ass kisser. You know, he was the general's boy, you know, never near the front line, never near combat. And he says he doesn't respect me as a military man. You know, there's only one of us that's been in combat and it wasn't him, you know. Okay. And he's like, you know, oh, if I if I disagree with Bentley, he'll devolve into rude behavior. You know, and listen, I'm not Prince Fauntleroy, you know, I'm not like uh Mr. Manners or anything, <laughs> but you know, I would I'm smart enough to know that if I were to debate him, you know, if I start cussing at him, you know, and 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 saying rude and stupid stuff, that's gonna make me look bad. Yeah, of, make him yeah, look I good. know. I mean that's that's a very it's it's a non argument. It's a non Uh, yeah, yeah so argument. Was, yeah, yeah. And I mean, he literally wrote that to a friend of mine that was in contact with him and said, hey, let's let's have this debate. And so he has no interest in finding the truth for himself by coming to Donbass. He has no interest in debating me because he knows it would be a battle of wits with an unarmed man. And I would, you know, I would just I would humiliate him because he's already humiliated himself. He's he's talking out of his ass about things that he doesn't know he's, he's, he's just trying to he's been you know, he's so. been he's been he's been he's becoming popular more, more and more um the thing is uh i used to fo i used to follow i don't follow anymore because he's been arrested uh, uh, a journalist that was uh, living in uh, in kharkov named gonzalo lira you know him mm -hmm. i know who he is uh and he's somebody that i never ever trusted either Yeah, and, and yeah, it's a, it's like I followed him. It was interesting to watch the show, and it, it, because he also was in contact with a lot of other uh, podcasters and bloggers that I follow too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, he written some interesting things. Actually, some of them never became true. Actually, his predictions, but nevertheless, he ended up being uh, arrested. But one of the things he said, and I don't want to, I, I mean, I don't want to amplify this. Uh, Uh, mm -hmm. uh, saying bad things about other people, but I just mentioned this. He, he said, "I don't want anything to do with Scott Ritter." I remember, it, and I was like, "Why? Why is it saying this?" It's like the guy can be this or that or that. I just don't want anything to do with him. In one of his uh, videos, he, he said this. Nevertheless, Scott Ritter was on, on RT very recently mm -hmm. uh, to, in a crosstalk with Peter Lavelle. And uh, mm -hmm. also was a Portuguese uh, analyst there, which I uh, actually enjoy uh, much. So he has some notoriety in the Russian media. He does. He does. I mean, and, but then again, understand that, you know, the, uh, the military war, the economic war, the information war, they're all, you know, you, they're so connected. You can't take any of them. Apart. No, 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 no. True. And, And the thing, the problem with the military war and the economic war is also a problem with the information war. war. What of all the of all the analysts, bloggers and that you find or follow or know of in the internet nowadays uh, that talk about uh, what's going on and well, pretty much that's the center of the whole geopolitical scene. Uh, but Wow, uh, who would who you ad yeah, uh, or would okay. you advise people to yes, go yes. to? Yes, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. This is what I would advise at first to everyone that's interested in knowing about what's going on in the Donbass War, which everyone in the world should be because, you know, this is the spear point of the war for the future of the world. And so the first thing I would say is get on Telegram. That is the most uncensored, open social media platform that there is in the world right now and you can find a lot of excellent information there um i'm on it i uh you can find me there um and i recommend just to get on telegram the guys that i okay first of all i get my information from the friends that i served with back in 2015 2017 almost all of my friends 
are on the front right now. They're still soldiers. Some of them are officers in Spetsnaz units. Some of them are officers in Wagner. Some of them are just, you know, trigger pullers. You know, they're just, you know, lifetime soldiers, snipers, you know, drone operators. You know, those guys that are on the front. I get my, when they, you know, they spend, you know, 27, 28 days a month on the front. And then they come back to Donetsk for two or three days of, uh, you know, relaxation. Yeah, relaxation. Yeah. And when they come back, we get together, you know, and I'm like, dude, tell me what's the real situation. So I get my information directly from people that I served with that, you know, brothers in arms, you know, that I risked my life for, that I was willing to die for them and them the same for me. So the trust is, you know, it, it's, it's absolute, you know, yeah. they're not going to, you know, tell me anything except what they know to, to be the truth, you know? Okay. As far as like other journalists, um, uh, there's a guy, Alexander Sladkov. Uh, he's, uh, he's been one of the main Russian war correspondents since the Afghan war. Mm -hmm. S L A D K O V. He has, he has a channel can, on tele. Can you like, like, uh, send me those links through our, yes, tel uh, sure our V, our, sure. our, okay. V yeah, contact. Yeah, I'll send those to you. So Alexander Sladkov. Yeah. He's, uh, He's the greatest uh, Russian war correspondent, you know, I mean, since Afghanistan, you know, and he's and he's on the front right now. You know, another guy that I follow is uh, my old battalion commander from Vostok Battalion, yeah. Alexander Kodakovsky, who's, of course, still on the front with his men right now. And I mean, he lives on the front um, and he's he's one of the guys he's, in my opinion, the greatest military leader that's ever been in Donetsk, you know, since the second world war, um, or in Donbass, you know, so, you know, and he's, he's a great man. He's, uh, he's a brilliant military leader. Uh, he's a true hero. He, um, he has a lot of political insight. Uh, he's also an Orthodox Christian, you know, so he's, he's, he's a great soldier. He's a good man. He's very wise. He's an absolute hero. Um, he doesn't post a lot, but I read every single thing that he writes, you know. Uh, there's another guy, uh, Oleg Sadev, who was a uh, politician in the Ukrainian Verkhonorada, a deputy. But as soon as the uh, Donbass Republic started back in uh, 2000, spring of 2014, he came over to us and he's, he's a brilliant politician very popular. Uh, he's not afraid to criticize the Russian government, you know, mistakes and shortcomings. You know, he's a real, he's a real hero. He's a real uh, friend of the people of Donbass and of Russia. He's a true patriot. You know, there's other guys, there's, you know, I mean, those would be Sladkov, Kodakovsky, and Sadev. Those are the main dudes that I read every day, you know, I mean, so Sarev lives in Russia now, but he has connections, you know, in the army and the politics on both sides, on the Ukrainian mm -hmm. and a Russian side. You know, Sladkov is always on the front. Kodakovsky is always on the front. You know, there's, uh, you know, between those three guys, you can really know what's going on. I mean, and the thing to understand is that, you know, when dudes like uh, Martyanov or Ritter say, oh, you know, don't worry, Russia's going to kick their ass any day now, you know. That was before the Crimea Bridge got blown up. That was before, you know, the reversals and the retreats. You know, uh, that was before, you know, the dam got blown up and flooded, you know, all the way down the Dnieper River. Yeah. You know, there's a, some serious concern right now about the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. True. You know, true. there's going to be a false flag. Mm -hmm. Some Something's going to happen there. The Ukrops are in and NATO, their bosses are going to cause something to happen at that power plant for they can have an excuse to bring NATO in, to bring Polish so called peacekeepers or la di da. Oh, okay. I mean, so this, let's, this war is far from over. Yeah, it is. It's far from one. Let, let, so let me. 
now that you mentioned the Zaporizhia power plant, and, uh, and it's been, it has been a lot of talk about uh, a possible attack on there, and uh, because we've seen also declarations from uh, from uh, senators of, of the United States, I think it mm -hmm. was, uh, I don't know if it was Lindsey Graham, uh, and uh, it was like saying that this would be a, enough reason to get in. Uh, and so, do, but if they are finding reasons, if the West is finding reasons to put NATO uh, on, on the ground, isn't that uh, an, an, an indicative that they are losing militarily? Well, I mean, of course, the Ukrainian army, and, and of course, it's, it's obvious and simple to say that the Ukrainian army could never have defeated the Russian army. Mm -hmm. That was never, ever the question. And I mean, even myself, when the Russians came in, I made a video like on the second day of the special military. I, I, I kept that. I kept that, you know, near the convoy. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And I said, and we're going to liberate the good guys and the bad guys. Yeah. We're going to kick their ass. And it certainly seemed that way at the time. But that was before me and a lot of other people understood you know that some shady deals are getting done in the background you know on the military front on the economic front on the information war front you know so you know you can't i mean you can't win a fight against a serious enemy which and then now we understand that we're not fighting the ukrainian army we're fighting all of nato all of nato yes but you mm -hmm. can't win a fight against a serious enemy, you know, if you have to worry about, you know, somebody that you trust stabbing you in the back while you're fighting. True, true. And that's that's the development that we've seen. That was the wild card that came up that now makes, you know, what should have been a turkey shoot and a cakewalk and, you know, a two-month yes. liberation yeah. still going on, you know, a year and a half later and not really much uh, has changed, you know? So it's, uh, I mean, the power, the power plant is the most dangerous threat right now. I mean, because I mean, and you understand that like when they brought in depleted uranium, yeah, you know, and yep. the Russians hit the warehouse where probably not all, but a big chunk of it was, <laughs> Yeah. And a depleted uranium cloud went west. Yes. Yes, it, it go it goes west from there. That's right. Yes. And the thing is, you know, I mean, that stuff's no joke, man. Anybody that, you know, says, oh, well, you know, whatever. All you have to do is look up birth defects, depleted uranium, and it will give you nightmares to see what that stuff does. The cancer rates go off the chart. In Iraq and in Serbia, where that stuff was used, it is... I mean, it's absolutely, it's a crime against humanity to even have those things, much less use them. And they're, you know, and, and when the U.S. or NATO says, oh, it's, it hasn't been proven dangerous, that's an absolute lie. And I mean, so if they're going to blow up dams and flood 110,000 acres of prime farmland in a time when the world is going through a serious food shortage already, you know, when they're going to flood whole cities, you know, when, they, you know, when, you know, they've already used chemical weapons. You know, the fact of the biological laboratories here is confirmed by any, you know, only an idiot can question whether or not that actually occurred. You know, whether or not mm -hmm. they were using laboratories in Ukraine to create deadly viruses, to create vectors like mosquitoes or rats or whatever to spread deadly diseases, whether they were trying to design uh, viruses and diseases that attacked a certain uh, DNA genotype, which is Slavic. You know, I mean, th these are all facts, you know I mean? So these guys, I mean, you know, they're, I don't want to sound dramatic or, you know, mumbo jumbo, but these are genuine Satanists, man. These are, this is evil incarnate. These guys make Hitler look like a playground bully. The, uh, talking talking about the environment, the other day, uh, Greta Thunberg, 
went to sh shake Zelensky's hand. So I think everything is good now, and uh, environment-wise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's. I mean, it's it's all theater, you know. Yeah, true. I I really. I mean, that's that was a. And it, you know, and it's, it's like. The parasite class, the oligarch class, the billionaires. In every country in the world, those are our enemies. Those are the enemies of humanity. Mm -hmm. I saw like a, a cartoon the other day. It was really brilliant. It was a chessboard. And all the pieces were laying there on the chessboard covered in blood. And then off to the side, there was like a table with a big feast and wine glasses and candles. And the, the black king and queen and the white king and queen were sitting down at that table having a feast together. Yeah. While you know, the rest of yeah yeah that's representative yeah I understand mm -hmm. yes, yes and I right. and I really think that's what's the case you know and unless and until you know the people of each country deal with their own parasites themselves you know the world is in in mortal danger you know I mean Russia so far has been you know the obstacle to you know, the World Economic Forum and the New World Order, whatever you call it, you know, this depopulation plan that they have that's real, bro, that's real. I mean, it was not a mistake that the vaccine vaccines that they forced on people around the world. Well, I, I don't want to say anything about that, you know. Yeah, yeah, YouTube, yeah, but, yeah, because they, 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 they yeah, platform me in, right. in, in a jiffy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean. I wanted to I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some other things if you have time of course uh, yes yes bro uh, okay so uh, there is also claims in the broadly done in the Western mainstream media about the morale of the Russian troops about the training quality of the Russian troops I know that uh, one must imagine that the, the quality of the training is not homogeneous, is not uh, the same everywhere along the front line. But is mm -hmm. it true? But what is it, is it true that like the the on the Russian side, despite all the all the problems that you mentioned already on, on the Russian apparatus, is it true that they send just com conscripts with a barely trained and or this is just a... no? That's not true. That's that's pure propaganda. Okay. The Russian soldiers that are coming here are well trained. Um, some are conscripts. There's more volunteers than conscripts coming, you know. And the thing is, they have excellent training. I mean, up until recently, they had Wagner training them. Wagner was the guys who were training us back in 2015 when I joined the right. Hans Petznaz Battalion. The instructor. You know, yeah, positive noy instructor. But you know, and, okay. <laughs> and so, you know, and those guys knew what they were doing, you know, and, you know, they're combat proven. I mean, the Russian army, you know, the rank and file, you know, division commanders, battalion commanders, regular soldiers, sergeants are outstanding soldiers, you know, and I mean, and they they love their country and they're they're very brave they're very tough and if there's any problem in the morale it's that they're beginning to wonder you know what are we doing here wh why are we fighting who what are we fighting for for yeah yeah you know i mean because you understand that if the bridge, I mean, the bridges across the Dnieper in Ukraine could be blown up in one night. And yeah, yeah, true. And and that would cripple the entire Ukrainian NATO army east of the Dnieper. It would cripple them. And the fact that it hasn't been done, you know, is confusing to a lot of soldiers that are on the front that, you know, have to bury their friends. You know, I'll mm -hmm. tell you, since since I got here, I've buried 11 friends, 11 soldiers that I served with who were killed in combat. 
Five of them were killed in the first eight years, and six of them were killed in the last year and a half. You know, so, I mean, and I understand that war is war and, you know, people are going to die and like that. But, I mean, if if somebody sends you to the front, but they don't send the ammunition with you, you know, I mean, you understand they blew up a bridge when they thought Wagner was going to Moscow. They blew up a Russian bridge. And they dug up a roads also. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but they still can't blow up these uh you crop bridges for some reason and that i mean you know when when things that affect whether or not you're going to live or die those are things that you pay very close attention to and when guys say well how come you know there's 10,000 more you crop troops here that came across that bridge on that train you know how how come these uh, new Panzer tanks from Germany, yeah, Leopard yeah. tanks and stuff? Yeah, how did they get here? They didn't, you know, they didn't drive all the way. Yeah, you no, know, from you know, <laughs> and it's like, okay, we now we have to deal with them. Yeah, there's that... a choke point across the river where there would be a lot less of them. You know, so people, you know. So they, that is that, yes, I, I I understand. I'm sorry to cut you, uh, no, but no, I but I think I think this point has been made and and uh, unfortunately, but I also asked myself these questions before with all the Russian capabilities, military capabilities. Why weren't they cutting all the doing real inter, serious interdiction to the to the Ukrainian uh, front lines, uh, and uh, you you bringing up. A lot of light to this issue as I as I talk to you. Do do you think, even if uh, Prigozhin was uh, right on all of this, all these claims, and that all of that this that we've talked about, all this corruption because that's the right word for it. Do you think it's still justifiable to do that to put out a military column on the road to Moscow? I mean, because that also. In my point of view, at least, that also can weaken the... the... Yes, and you know, and I, I'll tell you something. Um, I, I don't think it was justifiable. And I'll tell you why. And it's because now, you know, in Russia, people's... It's very, it was very divisive. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, and I, you know, and I'm not saying that Prigozhin's a bad guy. I, I, uh, I respect him very much, and I consider him to be a patriot. Laundry I shouldn't be done him. in public. I mean, well, I mean, I think that the reason that it was done in public is because so many times, so you know. Time after time after time after time, he, was fed he up. tried to go through the regular channels, and they just blew him off. You know, I mean, okay. it's like, you know, if somebody owes you a thousand bucks, and you call him up every day, yeah, you know, sooner or later you're going to go to his house. You have to go there, and yeah, if yeah. he never answers, you know. Yeah. So I think it was a situation like that. I mean, the 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 problem was that. Prigozhin had legitimate complaints, legitimate issues okay. that were simply ignored. And with this thing where Shoigu, the ultimate provocation, where he said that, okay, everybody in Wagner has to sign a contract by July 1st, which would have basically deleted Wagner. It would have put Shoigu in charge of everything that Prigozhin and some of his, you know, you understand that it was not Prigozhin's choice to make that march. It what? was. Well, I he, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Tell me. Yes, this is a fact. He he made a council of all his main combat commanders and said, what should we do? And they are the ones. And these are all, you know, heroes of Russia. You know, these are all, you know, the greatest soldiers 
in the history of Russia. Okay. Okay. And he asked them what to do, and they said, let's go. Okay. And so that's what they did. You know what I mean? It was it it was a very educational experience. You know, uh, absolutely, there's no question that Prigozhin was not trying to overthrow President Putin or the Russian government at all. He was protesting. Yes, he was protesting. And I mean, and, and if you think about it much more mildly, then they're protesting in Paris tonight, you know. Well, well true, <laughs> true. I mean, I mean, that's a very, that's a great comparison. Uh -huh. Great. By and the way, that's not being properly covered by the Western media. It's course, very, being very mildly covered, very mildly. They're speaking about it, but they show minimal amount of images. I've been seeing everything on Telegram channels. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I mean, and you've uh, seen uh, that uh, weapons that were sent to Ukraine are now in the hands yeah, of yeah. French rebels. Yeah, true, mm -hmm. true, true. So no surprise there. But as far as Prigozhin goes, you know, he was provoked to the last instance, you know, the thing about signing the contract. And so he wasn't a traitor. He isn't a traitor. And things worked out the absolute best way they could. Because I'm sure that Vladimir Putin knows that, Prigozhin is one of his most loyal friends. Okay. You know, would would die for Vladimir Putin in a heartbeat without hesitation. Mm -hmm. As would 98% of of Wagner soldiers, you know. And so how would you describe the 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 role of uh, Lukashenko in the in, the, in well, all of this? He's a really cool guy, man. I mean, he's a real communist. I really like and admire him. You know, he's, you know, he's the greatest hero out of this whole thing, you know, because it was his brilliant idea to stop the confrontation. And look what happened. So Russia just moved nuclear weapons to Belarus. Now they have the most loyal and most combat ready guards for those nuclear weapons. You know, uh, NATO and the West are getting ready to try another color revolution. True, yeah, yeah. I know. Lukashenko in Belarus. Now he's got the most combat ready and seriously loyal. I mean, and plus, you know, uh, Wagner went from being 300, 400 kilometers away from Kiev to being 100 kilometers. Yeah, yeah. Away Just from next Kiev. to it. Just next to it. Yeah. But and so. Yeah, the, the but, Ukrainians have expressed some concern about that. Uh, and the Poles and the Latvians. Yeah, yeah. As well they should, as well mm -hmm. they should. Because so it worked out great. You know, I mean, maybe, you know, some people say, oh, it was all, you know, it was all just a play and they were, you know, yeah. they were all in it and that were gonna, this is what they were going to do. I don't know, man. I mean, Prigozhin is a guy a lot like myself. No, you either love him or hate him. No, he's going to say what he thinks. He might use some impolite language from time to time if he feels it's necessary. But, you know, when it comes down to it, there's nobody more loyal to the Russian Federation and the Russian people. And, you know, and he's a real hero and he's a real genuine badass soldier, you know. Well, and then, uh, the soldiers yeah. love him. Well, and Lukashenko made his point in this uh, recently on an interview to the BBC, which I was very surprised to see the BBC mm -hmm. interviewing Lukashenko. But he didn't. I mean, it was it was assertive. It, it, it was right on spot. I shared that, that clip on, on, on my VK page. Yeah, um, it's a great interview. Yes, it is. And he, he says it like it is. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the zones that that have seen war, and now are apparently uh, at peace. At least you never know when a shell or a missile or storm shadow is going to hit those. But uh, for example, Mariupol, I've been seeing footages of new mm -hmm. apartment, brand new apartment blocks with all the equipments needed, well planned uh, urban areas. Uh, is that uh, Russian propaganda or is that true? No, it's very real. They really, 
I mean, <clears throat> they've rebuilt Mariupol so quickly and so well that it kind of pisses off people in Donetsk. <laughs> True. Okay. <laughs> you know, because, because remember, dude, until, yeah. you know, two years ago, Mariupol was as of. Yeah, was as of, uh, as of heaven, yeah. And everybody that lived there was Ukrainian. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the people of Donetsk, who have been defending themselves and Russia for all these years, mm -hmm. are kind of uh, playing second fiddle. You know, I mean, we, and we did have a great improvement just uh, the beginning of July. You know, for over a year now in Donetsk, we've had, you know, tap water once every three days. Oof. And, uh, and that's been pretty tough, you know. I mean, and just recently it's gone to every other day. Oh. So every second day, are are but, uh, are uh, petal long distance mining still a, a problem in, in in Donetsk? By the way, uh, yes, it is. Uh, I mean, because the thing is, those those mines, and this is why they're illegal and a war crime to use. They don't like have a self destruct. They don't have a a timer mechanism where they either blow themselves up or become inert. So, you know, and there's a and they've. They've laid a lot of them down here. I mean, some friends of ours in Petrovsky District that lived, you know, less than two kilometers from our house, um, you know, and their yard was overgrown because they had moved to the center of the city too. And so they had, you know, like waist high grass. Some of their neighbors, like two houses down, said they found some petal mines. And so they had to, Check their yard. They found like 10 pedal mines in their Ooh. backyard. Okay. And so, I mean, it's they're very dangerous. They're not especially deadly, except like to little kids or something, but, you but know, they'll are... blow half your leg off. If yeah, you yeah. Them. They cripple you. Yeah. For good, yeah. Uh, okay, going, going back to the subject of uh, Mariupol, do you think that uh, the same treatment for Donetsk, it's not being given and given perhaps because the nets is still very close to the front line exactly that is exactly the reason why and that's a legitimate reason but then it also begs the next question why in the hell what? is it still very close close to the, to front, the front line, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah 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 and i mean and really you know between avdievka and uh, mari inka the front line hasn't moved at all from what it was no eight years ago no but i mean there... literally not at all But there has been offensives. Uh, was is in FDF now that the Russians yeah. are on the offensive? Well, I mean, and of course it's a very, very tough nut to crack. I mean, Avdievka. I served on the Avdievka front in 2017, and it was very. I mean, the, no civilians were living there even back then. Yeah. I mean, you know, maybe a few hundred or something. It was a giant military base. I mean, it was being fortified then. I mean, they're digging, um, and just like in, in Bakhmut, was a lot the same way. They're digging tunnels between buildings, you know, so they can move ammo from one building to another. They can move soldiers, you know, they can, you know, our guys can go into a, you know, five-story apartment building, clear every apartment, go on to the next step, and then on the way back. They have people shooting at you, them, yeah. You, you crops in the apartment again, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. how the heck did they get there? You know, I mean, so Abdievka is the most fortified position on the whole Ukrainian front. And uh, a lot of good guys died at the beginning of the special military operation. A lot of DPR soldiers were uh, ordered to make a frontal assault on that. And it was it was their meat grinder, you know. Okay. So, I mean, it has to be. They have to be like encircled and brought, you know, and come in from behind. That's the only way to do it. And I mean, it's not impossible. I mean, remember the Second World War, you know? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There was as big and bigger armies were defeated by the Soviets back then. And I mean, a lot of people died, a lot of good soldiers died. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, War is not something 
that should be like you know trifled with or played with. If you if you're gonna do a war, then go in and win. You know, Sun Tzu, he wrote The Art of War 2,500 years ago. I've read that book at least 50 times, probably 100 times. Wow. And every principle in that book applies exactly as much today as it did back then. Yes. And, you know, one of the things he said, no country ever benefits from a long war. A war. Okay. Because you this know, is so this message is being like sold like it's an attrition war, it's advantages to Russia, blah blah blah. But I don't see I see it as uh, I see it like listen, you said, it's the fact is the longer this war goes on, the more dangerous it is for Russia. Yeah. And that's the simple fact, man, because I mean, first of all, you know, it's uh you know, just you know, bombing the civilians. You know, oh, then we have a little chemical weapons. Oh, then we have a dirty bomb. Yeah. Oh, then we have, we're going to blow up the nuclear power plant. Keeps escalating. You know, I mean, yeah. The provocations and the escalations are going to continue from the UCROP NATO side until there is a decisive victory by the Russians that seriously demilitarizes Ukraine and denazifies it. I mean, And to me, you know, the minimum, minimum to achieve, a, a, you know, what can seriously be called victory is for Russia to take Kiev on a line down to the northern border of Moldova and everything east of it. I mean, mm -hmm. to say, oh, we're going to negotiate and maybe the Ukraps will say we can keep Crimea and we can keep keep. Uh, Donbass uh, or Kherson and Donbass and Donetsk and Lugansk and Zaporozhye or oh we'll go to the Dnieper and we'll be on one side and they'll be on the other side that does not cut it that does not cut it that's uh you know and it's yeah somebody you know the, you know the old saying uh a bad peace is better than a good war that's not a true saying that's not a true saying and I'll tell you why bro Because a bad peace will always inevitably lead to a worse Worst war. war. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I, I see. And so there's no, there's no negotiating with Nazis. I mean, it's like trying to, you know, if a mad dog walks into your yard, you know, and you say, "Oh, <laughs> come here, boy, I'll give you some, <laughs> some, some, some yeah, dog yeah. food if you promise not to bite the kids," you know, you can't, you know, or. You know, this, the story about the scorpion and the frogs. Yeah, oh, yes. It's, yes, I know. It's their nature. You can never trust them. Only a fool trusts them or tries to make deals with them. They're, they only understand force. And so they must be either smashed or completely destroyed. And that goes for NATO, too. And if, if Russia can make a decisive military victory, if they, if, if they can marshal the political and military will to do what needs to be done if they can you know neutralize the traitors that are holding them back right now and do what needs to be done then that will show you know th they get to Kiev and then Russia says hey look you know we can be in Warsaw in another week too you know and we can be in Paris a month after that How do you see the? I mean, the 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 Polish have been very, very I don't know, uh, an adjective to describe them, but they have been very hawkish in the, in their stance towards uh, uh, Russia. I mean, uh, do you think there it it is their true intention to to enter in an open conflict with Russia? Because sometimes it seems so that they are eager. Well, so, you know what, and and uh, you know, first of all, you know, there's. I don't mean to like say stereotypes or something, you know, but you know, there's a reason that stereotypes are stereotypes. Types. You know, I mean, it's like you know, Germans like beer and sausage. You know, the French like wine. You know, uh, whatever like that. You know, and the Polish have a long historical reputation. Of being really stupid, you know, that's, <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's 
I'm not saying that they are, but I'm saying, I mean, no one can argue that that's not the reputation that they have. Mm -hmm. And it would be very stupid for Poland to go to open warfare with Russia. I mean, right now it's considered that the Polish have the strongest army in Europe. I mean, because the army of France and Germany and Britain, Italy, whatever, Spain, those are just jokes. I mean, they're, you know, they don't have enough stuff to make a parade with, you know. But Poland does have some serious fighters. There's a lot of them that are here right now. And they have M1 uh, Abrams tanks sure, uh, recently delivered. Uh huh. Well, I mean, they're, you know, they're probably next in line when Ukraine finally falls. The Polish are going to be the next uh, sacrificial goat that, you know, the U.S. and NATO are going to push towards Russia. You know, I mean, the thing is, it has to, I mean, for Russia to win, they have to have a decisive military victory that takes sufficient territory and holds it. If they use nuclear weapons, even tactical, tactical nukes, mm -hmm. they lose because that's just another yeah, yeah. escalation. True. So they just have they just have to have the political and military will to do what needs to be done. And in order to do that, they need to neutralize the the traitors in Moscow that are preventing that from being done. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, decisive victory seems the, the the most logical thing. So, but I've like like I've said uh, previously, it's uh, each side sells its own um, ver its own brand of propaganda and uh, his own qualities. But uh, mm -hmm. the Ru and in the the Russian side has been selling, and a lot of pro-Russian uh, bloggers and media have been selling this that it's advant advantageous to to Russia, to the long war, because they will deplete, eventually deplete the Ukrainians. And one thought crossed my mind when I start hearing these arguments, which was Vietnam and uh, the, the, the American stance on the body count. It's like uh, mm -hmm. they, they say, eventually we will kill all the Vietnamese because we have more firepower. And this seems to me that it resembles the same kind of trend of thought. It's, uh, I mean, the people that say that the long war is the way to win, they're just idiots. I guarantee none of them have ever been in combat. None of them have ever been to Donetsk. They've never lived under shelling, you know. They've never, they don't understand what's really at stake here. The longer this war goes on, the more escalation and provocation from the West will happen. And that's, that's a simple fact. And that provocation could go all the way up to nuclear exchange. And then nobody wins. Nobody wins. You know, I mean, so, I mean, the, the, I mean, one of the things, one of Russia's biggest sociological problems for you know the next century is you know uh population demographics I, i've been you know, they mm -hmm. they Please need to they don't, they don't need to have all their men get killed they need to increase their population and a long war does not increase populations no no you know, the people that die the people that are crippled the people that move away you know it's You know, I mean, so the main objective of Russia, besides its own survival, is to increase its population over the next hundred years. And you don't do that with a long war. No, uh, but the, the basis I've been uh, go, <clears throat> um, yes, doing my own research in the in demographics to know about the state of the countries. And I was watching this, uh, you know, the pyramids of the age, the age pyramids mm -hmm. of each country. And uh, if you have a short, a narrow base, That's a very bad sign uh, because not enough uh, newborns. You're not having mm -hmm. enough newborns, and uh, Russia is not was not the the, the prettiest uh, pyramid to. Well, to I see. mean, you know, I mean, it's like I married my wife, 2017. Um, I was 60; she was 40. She's like, "All right, let's have some kids." You know, it's time to have kids. And I'm like, 
you know, let's wait until <laughs> after victory because I don't want to bring a kid into a world where I can't be sure okay. that I can take care of him, that I have to worry about him getting blown up on the way back from school, you know, that I have to wonder if, you know, I'm going to have to carry him on my back uh, across the Russian border someday, you know, to be a refugee or something like that. I said, let's wait until after victory. You know, back then I thought, you know, maybe another year or something, you know, but you know, now it's almost nine years and it's like, you know, uh, so that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. War, war does not promote, you know, having babies. Yes. Or development, only the development of the already rich billionaires. Exactly. Uh, just one last uh, question. I wanted to. Uh, I was one. I we would have log. I would have much more questions, but I just want to. I don't want to burn all my all my ammunition at once. And I'm sure yeah. we'll have more updates and uh, future opportunities well, to let's, talk. Instead of doing two hours every year, <laughs> let's do an hour every few months or something. Every few months. Uh, well, it's for me. It would be. It's very good that you brought up that because I, I really wish for that sometimes i just don't want to bother people <laughs> bro uh, it's, um, I, i like very much talking with you uh uh i like uh, your um perspective your presentation uh it's a real honor for me to be on your thank you uh, likewise podcast so any any kind it's no bother call me anytime man so I uh, thank you for that, and I will hold that. <laughs> I will hold Excellent. you accountable Excellent. for that. <laughs> uh, Colonel, Colonel McGregor, do you are you? Uh, yes, I am. What about his opinions? Because well, he I he think, has military insight, supposedly. Yes, he does. I mean, but you understand, uh, I see him as kind of uh, another uh, overly optimistic for the Russian side. You know, I mean. These guys, I mean, to me, he's his his kind of. I mean, and he he seems like a man that has a let, lot more uh, understanding of the situation than, say, Scott Ritter or um, you know, a cheerleader like Martinov. But at the same time, I mean, you know, you understand that the Russian, I mean, the American military and intelligence community is really not that much to brag about. You know, they've they've gotten a lot of stuff wrong. They've gotten a lot of major stuff wrong over the years, you know. So these dudes that say, oh, I used to be an intelligence officer. I was in the CIA or la, la, la. You know, so what? You know, that and a dollar will get you a ride on the bus to Washington, D.C., you know. I mean, so the the way to understand what's really going on is to talk to the people that are doing it, you know? And I mean, not just the soldiers. I mean, I'm not saying that I know everything just because I'm here in Donetsk, but I know the guys that do know a lot. I know the guys that are on the front. You know, I know what the problems are that get spoken about and don't get spoken about. And so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm the ultimate expert. I'm not saying that I know more than McGregor, although I probably do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying that. I am saying that I know more than Scott Ritter because he's just somebody that's just not interested in knowing what he's talking about. His goal is to tell people what they want to hear to get on more talk shows. So, I mean, my main goal is to defend the future of humanity. And that's why I came to Donbass. Because as goes Donbass, so goes the world. world bro. Yeah. I've been saying that since 2015, and it gets more and more true every day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I didn't come here to make a name for myself or be a YouTube star or get on talk shows. You know, when I came here, I came here to join the army and fight. Yeah, and you did it. Which, yes, you, you... And I did it. Yeah. And I, I, to be honest... When I came in December of 2014, I did not expect to live until the spring. And I did, but it was a miracle that I did. I mean, so many yeah. times I was so close by centimeters or by seconds. 
you know, that I would have been, you Blown know, up. shot between the eyes or, yeah. you know, blown into hamburger or whatever, you know. So for me, it's not just about, uh, you know, how many views I get or, you know, how many donations I get. You know, it's about what helps to defend Donbass, Russia, and the future of humanity. Mm-hmm. And that's my motivation, and that's what I get up every morning to do. And I don't care who likes it, and I don't care who likes me. Yes, yes. Do, well, I, I, I must confess that is one of uh, one of the reasons. And I've mentioned I've mentioned you the last time I talked to Mike Jones. is is an English expat. Uh, he was living in Saint Petersburg. He's now in Moscow. And uh, for I've I've spoke to him also for about two times, and very recently the second time, and I've I've mentioned that uh, I was already had intentions to speak to you again, and and he was like he also said it, he also recognized it. When we have to to acknowledge that you you say it like it is. I mean, you have no you don't. You don't go around the subject and or or trying to make it nice euphemism or uh, I mean for, for, know, for, for, forgive if my English is not no uh, no I, that's I, a, I, you, you you say exactly how it would be said in English and I mean and I, and it's not my intention to be rude I mean but this is serious business we're talking about a yeah, war it is. we're talking uh, yeah, about yeah. the deaths of thousands or millions of people yeah, yeah. you know we're talking about the future of humanity it's it's not the time to uh you know say please and thank you you know especially if you see somebody that's you know and mike jones i think is a good guy he's done some good work here uh i respect him yes you know there's some of the other guys i, I respect tim kirby too yeah. um but there's you know there's guys in in moscow that you know they're just that that came here and that you know they're just having a party you know they yeah. they spend more in a titty bar in a week than they could buy three Mavic drones with what they're spending in the topless joint you know True. and uh, you know that kind of stuff you know I mean it just I mean to be honest I find it contemptible you know and you know and and they're you know again making the money making the name for themselves and doing enough to make it look like they're helping you know. Okay. Yes. And that I mean and to me, you know, that's just like, you know, the most crass opportuni- opportunism, you know. I do I yeah. do notice. I do notice and especially with YouTube, I don't have a, I mean, I have a small channel because my channel mainly began because of uh, local issues, political issues, but very local. And I feel I live in a small community, so I never expected huge views or anything enough to monetize it. And I don't intend to monetize it. And uh, let's keep it that way. I, I don't want to depend. I don't want to look for the bucks, because once yeah. that becomes my objective, my the message becomes uh, only working in in that f- in function of that. And and it, yeah uh, yeah and I I I observe that I observe that I watch podcasts like the Duran I think they do great analysis but sometimes I think something is is uh, lacking there because now they have the obligation to hold to that audience and I don't want to have yeah. I don't want to have that if I have bad news to give uh, bad news will be given well the, I mean the 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 easiest road to, you know, popularity and success is to tell people what they want to hear, you know, Mm -hmm. confirm their opinions, give them good news, say everything's going to be okay. Don't worry. Yeah. You know, the cavalry is coming. Yeah. The good guys are going to win. And that's what people want to hear. That's what ultimately. Yes. Yes. I know. And, you know, and, you know, so, I mean, dude, you know, if, if, I can tell you this, man, uh, as a salesman or a lawyer, I could, if I had chosen to be one of those, I would, I would have a hundred million dollars right now. <laughs> and, and really when I see some of these dudes, you know, that have big channels and are making a lot of money and are getting a lot of exposure and stuff like that. And I mean, you know, intellectually, you know, they're 
I mean, it, it's hard for me to even think of some way to compare, you know, how good. I mean, if I was going to just do like, you know, be a mercenary and be in it for money, dude, believe me. Yes. I would, I would be, I would be living in Moscow and, uh, you know, the recipe you know, driving yeah. a Bentley. Yeah. Driving a all my girlfriends would be driving Bentleys too, man, because if I was in it for the money, you know, I, you know, I could do it, but I'm in it. I mean, dude, all the money that I've brought here, I gave away, man. Yes. Yes. I got a, I got a 33 year old Neva bro that I keep putting band-aids on, you know, I, I, the house that we, that we own was my wife's dad bought it for us. You know, it's a small house. It's got a big garden but it's old house. It's a small house, but I don't, you know, I'm like, uh, Mujica, you know, the old, uh, president of Bolivia. Yeah. Oh, Bolivia. Mujica. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I know him. I mean, that, that dude, very humble guy. He, yes. Yeah. I drove a Volkswagen, a Volkswagen. Bus, <laughs> waited in line for the clinic with everybody else. You know, that's, that's the way I am, man. I mean, I've, you know, I come from a rich family, you know, I, I hung around very, very rich people, you know, oligarchs. Um, when I was a kid, You know, um, I made a lot of money in, in my early 30s. I made a couple of million bucks, uh, kind of outside outlaw type stuff. But, <laughs> you know, I made the money, you know. And it, I, I mean, it wasn't I mean, anything. I, I read you know. something about you on the web <laughs> about, well, about that. <laughs> well, you know, and it's interesting, you know, and I mean, and it's a known fact. You know, I used to be a marijuana smuggler and I was good at it. And at the same time that I was doing that, I was also working. I was one of the main dudes in the United States to work to legalize marijuana. And you know what? It's mostly legal, legal. in most of the states True. in the United States now. True. It is. It is. And so, you know, I don't. I'm not really. I'm. I'm not at all ashamed about having done that. No, no, no. Don't be. A hundred times more if I'd been selling mm -hmm. cocaine or heroin or methamphetamine. No, no, no. But it was only weed. Only weed. And I don't. I don't apologize for it at all. But I made a lot of money, you know. I mean, the jobs when I when I put my mind to something, I do a good job of it. Mm -hmm. I do a good job of mm -hmm. it, you know. And there's and I take it seriously, and I work hard at it too, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if if I was in it for money, I'd be rich right now, and I'm not, sure. you know. And I've, you know, of all the money that I mean, the human aid. I never touched a penny of, but even of the money that was sent just to support me, probably the money that people sent to me for me, I probably gave away half of that too, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, that's probably 50,000 bucks over the last 10 years, at least, you know, so, you know, and then, and when I was making a lot of money back in my thirties, I gave away about 30% of that too, you know? And so, you know, people are what they do, you know? I mean, you only really can own what you give away. True. True. And so, and you, you know, you, and you need enough. You need only enough. You need only, you know, you don't need more than enough. It's like, I well, need for, I need to provide for my kids and to have a decent. Yeah. I mean, it would, I would, I would like to have more money. I would like to have a steady job, you know, The Russian government and the DPR government never, ever paid me a penny. Never once. You know, I never, RT, nobody ever paid me to do a job to say something for them. And one and could say that you years. are a, 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 on Putin's payroll. <laughs> yeah, no one can say that. No one can say that. But, uh, you know, and that's okay with me because it lets me, I don't have to be scared about where my next paycheck's coming from because I don't get a paycheck. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's in the hands of God. And so far I've been very lucky. You know, I would like to have enough money where I don't have to wonder if I'm going to be able to pay for the next thing that breaks on my car or something like that. But it always happens. It always happens that somebody pitches in right at the emergency moment. And so I believe in God and uh guardian angels and i'm in the hands of god it's been a pleasure to talk to you russell and uh, we let's let's uh, hold on to that uh, to what we just talked 
minutes before. Let's do this more often. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, what what can I say? Just uh, hold on. I really, it's really refreshing because I I feel that I've I've been overwhelmed in the past months by all the. I try to search for information. The information that I feel more attracted to, I confess, it's the, it's I find it on the Russian uh, Telegram channels, like Slavian Grad, for example. I don't know if you know mm, this channel. Sure, of course. Uh, mainly because they're communists too. Mm. Uh, but I try not to be blinded by any belief and try to search for the truth. But uh, lately, sometimes I feel that things don't connect. And I had this. Uh, I I've, I got to talk to Russell again and see what he says. I mean, you've been you've been very much suppressed from the web and from and from Western means and and so if I as long as I I can do it, I will I will promote and talk to you and promote our conversations. All right, so thanks a lot, bro. I'll uh, I'll send you those links uh, on. Yeah, DK, please do. Right? So I can put on the description of the of the YouTube video. Uh, I'm I'm just gonna take us off the air. Don't 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 go away yet, please. Okay. And uh, just want to thank people that have been watching, people that will watch. I will be sure to share this on all my uh, networks, including backing up on Rumble because that's very important to ensure the safety and. Uh, Thank you. Please follow Admiral Livre Foreign Affairs, which is the the branch dedicated to the foreign affairs of this channel. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we are